Welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden, your host. Glad you could join me. Hope things are well. You're getting out and breathing the fresh air, maybe doing some fishing or playing some golf. And of course, working with your dog. That's why we're all here today. We're going to be discussing that, among other things, with Alex Sparks. He's the columnist for Upland Almanac Magazine. He is a well-known three decades in the business dog trainer. Got some real interesting ideas about uh, young dogs and how they think. Uh, But I think we'll all learn something from Alec. We'll also preview what may be a tidal wave of hunters this fall. So some ideas on finding other places to hunt. We'll talk about um, where you went last season. And, of course, dog names. Yeah, I asked on Facebook, and believe me, I got some great answers. We'll be covering that later in the podcast. Anyway, hope you had a good weekend. Uh, Hope that you got some things accomplished, whether they were honeydews or dog training or fun for yourself. We went out and finally hit the Metolius River in Central Oregon. It's the river that got me to move here a long time ago. I don't get back near as much as I should. But there's other fishing out there, and uh, I try to make a pilgrimage once a year uh, to the Metolius just in case. And yeah, that was probably all about all the fishing I'll do there. Didn't hunt, I mean fish, real hard. Caught one good brown trout on a stream that's not known for brown, so that's kind of interesting. Ran the dog every day when we were out there. It's all national forest, and we found some open country and did some of that. Flick uh, showed me how warm it's getting early in the morning. Starting to watch out for that already. I was almost, almost ready to go out first thing this morning with him. Then I realized, whoop. Not today. Too much to do. Please be careful of that with your own dog. It could be a rough summer. Ours is as dry as I've ever seen it out here. So be careful. You know, in the Upland Nation Insights newsletter, I ask you a question most weeks, and many of you answer it. Thank you. And many of you responded to this last question, which was, did did you hunt just in your own state last season due to the pandemic. I fully expected a lot of people to have stayed home on a, on that basis, but no, 50% of you said to heck with that. I went hunting wherever I wanted, but a full 50% said, yeah, stayed in the own state, uh, my own state and um, shifted for myself there. I understand, you know, early on in the season, especially there was some, Some real question about whether they'd even let us in. Uh, We were in California a month and a half ago, maybe a little less than that. And uh, even up until the day we left, we were concerned that at some point somebody would say, nope, 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 can't stay here. You're from out of state, especially from a state with, you know, high infection numbers. Uh, But glad to see everybody is not letting that get them down and be interesting to see what happens with all of that this coming season. A lot of pent-up demand for travel, lodge visits. I'm seeing that already with my friends in that business. So, uh, yeah, keep it up. Tell me what you're doing. Check out the current edition of the Upland Nation Insights newsletter. Should be in your inbox Saturday morning. This part of the Upland Nation podcast is brought to you by Sage and Breaker Gun Care Products, crafted at the highest caliber. Always free shipping, always useful videos. Learn how to take care of your guns the right way. Take a look at some of the new stuff. Got a new modifiable gun cleaning rod slash cable system. And that CLP and gun grease are two favorites of mine. They're always in the back of the truck sageandbreaker.com is where you learn more about them. And uh, at uplandnationdeals.com, my new website where we basically broker the good stuff. 
If you don't need it, sell it there. If you need it, buy it there. Got some new collars and bird launchers in, another Filson coat for you. All sorts of great stuff. Check in regularly at UplandNationDeals.com. Excited to have another viewpoint. It's puppy season for a lot of people. Reading my current edition of the Upland Almanac magazine, uh, was intrigued by some of the thinking behind the words that Alex Sparks wrote in the column, The Check Cord. The headline is, Try a Different Approach. I'm always up for that anyway. Alex Sparks, owner of Snowbound Kennels in West Addison, Vermont, welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. Well, I can't thank you enough for uh, for having me on. It's a it's an honor, and I hope uh, your listeners find what I have to say uh, interesting or enlightening. Yeah, I think they will, and uh, you know, open minds are probably most important around here, and we're going to keep that as well. But you know, you wrote this piece, uh, and I want to get to that in in just a minute because it does it begs a lot of questions, and we're going to get into some philosophical aspects as well. But first off, tell me a little bit about your operation over there at Snowbound Kennels. Uh, all right, uh, I've been training professionally now for twenty nine. I'm in my twenty ninth year. Uh, I'm sixty three years old, but probably sixty three years old going on fifty. I'm lucky enough to be in uh, very very good health and lead a very uh, active lifestyle. I always have, um, and. Oh, gosh. I actually grew up with German Shepherds. Um, those were the first dogs I remember as a kid. And then uh, when I was 12 years old, my family was given a field trial Labrador washout by a friend. And uh, the dog, uh, she retained breeding rights to the dog. The dog was bred, and I was allowed to pick a puppy from that litter. So at 13 years old, I got my first dog of my own, a black Labrador female. And as a 13-year-old kid, I disappeared into the backyard with, I think I literally had <laughs> two canvas retrieving dummies and uh, my dog and was totally obsessed with it. And, you know, uh, what can you do as a 13-year-old kid? But uh, the dog was, um, uh, I don't think uh, time has clouded my memory. The dog, the dog was really, really nice. I know that literally the first uh, duck she ever saw hit the water um, that I shot she just swam out and got it and brought it back, you know, just like sort of we thought they were supposed to do with no training, you know, back <laughs> in the day. And uh, I was off to the races, pretty obsessed with that. Uh, our family then got another Labrador. Um, and I, I helped some friends with dogs. And I'm originally from Stowe, Vermont. And Stowe uh, has been the home of the Amateur National Field Trial I think twice, possibly three times. And it has extensive properties that have been developed just for training field trial retrievers. And like now in the winters, I generally travel south to Southern Pines, North Carolina to train in the winter. Um, Southern pros frequently travel north in the summer to get out of the heat. And I was able to hook up with some of those pros sort of in my, uh, my late 20s and basically a hobby turned into a passion and a passion turned into a profession. And I'm inter eternally grateful for those, those professionals that allowed me to mentor under them because I know some people just sort of fool with their own dogs and try and figure it out and, you know, hang out a shingle. I was lucky to get a real, uh, almost like a mentorship, formal education, working with some, uh, different professional trainers over the first uh, three, four, five years of my professional career that really helped start me out on the right foot. And uh, originally, I was I only trained retrievers. Uh, I was very interested in AKC field trials and just trained retrievers. A few years into that, someone asked me to train their uh, pointing dog. And I said, I, I don't train pointing dogs. And they said, well, can you get my dog to do what your English pointer does? And I'm like, oh, I can do that. <laughs> they said, well, <laughs> you're, you're training my pointing dogs. And, you know, then I, then I was off to the races training pointing dogs uh, probably now for about 26 years. 
Um, I also uh, train uh, pet dogs. Um, I kind of specialize in not specializing. Living here in Vermont, everyone wants to uh, hike and run and mountain bike and cross-country ski with their dog, but they need that off-leash control yeah. that we feel people are very accustomed to, but is kind of a rarity in the pet market. So the pet market discovered me about 12 or 13 years ago. And of course, with the pet market, then comes the behavioral issues. And after growing up with German Shepherds about four years ago, a client gave me a German Shepherd I had trained for them. They just got in a situation where they couldn't keep the dog and um, uh, asked me if I'd like it. And I, I we liked the dog when it was here in training. We had actually just let it live in the house. So uh, that dog came into uh, into our world and it, it um, got me interested in the world of protection dog training, police canine, dogs that bite when they're supposed to. And I don't do that professionally, but now I also own, in addition to an English Pointer and a Labrador, I own two Belgian Malinois and a German Shepherd. Ow, uh, I'm just thinking about the key words in that dogs that bite when they're supposed to uh that, that's got to be the biggest challenge but let's 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 steer it over back to the kind of the the hunting dog side yep. when you were when you were being mentored uh what what do you think was the most important thing you picked up from that experience that could be of relevant to all of us I was so fortunate in the people that, that I sort of stumbled across that helped me with my formal education. And they were very fair to their dogs. Um, they were, they had great emotional control. I didn't see them get angry. I never saw them take out their frustration on the dog. Their programs were fair. They were balanced. Uh, they were very logical. And that really, the, the care they took of their dogs and their approach to training uh, and the fairness in their training, uh, you know, uh, that had been my background with animals. Sure. Um, and it further cemented that that was the way that they should be treated. Yeah, it's funny you bring up that word because I, I'd never seen that word before until I used it in, in one of my books a while back, quite a while back now which by the way is coming out in paperback in October, but, um, fairness you know, to a dog, can you, can you define that? And I'll chime in if I, if I feel I have to, but how would you define that in, uh, in a relationship with a dog? Dogs don't make moral decisions and dogs generally make decisions based on what's best for them. Okay. And, clearly as hunting dogs sometimes we need them to do things that aren't really in their best interest you know we want uh pointing dogs to be steady uh we want flushing dogs to hop or sit on the flush and that's not great for them they want to go catch the bird okay um so the fairness comes from thoroughly teaching a dog what it needs to know and for a million years, and how I was brought along uh, as an intuitive trainer, meaning there was no science behind my training. Um, it was just I was taught that this is how you do it by other trainers, and it seemed fair, it seemed logical, and that's the way I went. And we were always teaching with some low level of consequence or compulsion. Sure. The first day you work your uh, flushing dog or your retriever in obedience, you know, they're on a leash and some type of neck collar, a flat collar, uh, uh, a choke chain back in those days was very popular. Now perhaps a prong collar. And right off the bat, you're, you're teaching the dogs uh, to do behaviors with consequences, okay? Um, the analogy I like to use is it's sort of, like, sort of like teaching a toddler not to reach in a cookie jar by putting a rat trap in there. Um, he reaches in, he gets a couple broken fingers, uh, big consequences, and, and he learns. He learns to avoid it. Um, some people might think that was a great idea. A lot of other people might not think it was prudent. Um, the more logical approach might be to explain to your child and teach your child, these are the rules. We don't reach into the cookie jar. And then 
the this is how it's going to be enforced. These are the the, the escalating penalties for non-compliance with what we have taught you, and then they really need to be those uh, penalties uh, need to be fairly enforced, um, given the temperament of the child and his age and what he knows, his experience and things like that. So you, you know. I trained dogs for a million years with with choke chains and then prong collars from day one. And quite frankly, I disparaged any reward-based training for 18 years of my professional career. Um, I think you can be artful with those tools. Um, but unfortunately, I think uh, for the dogs, unfortunately, some people aren't very artful. It's sort of yank and crank. And quite honestly, if you aren't really concerned about a dog's training environment, it's not really very hard to train a dog, okay? If you yeah. are concerned about the environment the dog trains in and fairness to the dog, it, it, it's actually quite an art. And most people judge their training program by the end product, okay? Um, they think uh, their end product validates their training process, where in my world, your training process validates the results you get. By the way, you're listening to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden, the host, and that's Alex Sparks, the guest. He's with Snowbound Kennels. Alec, yeah, what you're talking about is ego here. Uh, there are a lot of amateur and professional dog trainers who have to lord it over the dog. They have to make sure the dog understands who the boss is. And um, and that manifests itself in any number of ways. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of times it manifests itself with a, you know, a collar set on 11. But y y you're alluding to the fact that I think you've seen the light. And for uh, 22 years, um, you've done things a little bit differently. How does that all re how does that all relate to the younger dogs, uh, as in your column? You're talking about shaping behaviors and, and young dogs. Uh, give us an overview. Right. I, I still think one can use regular tools of compulsion and consequence, such as leashes and collars and things like that. I think you can, if someone is skilled and artful, I think those are still really viable tools that can train a dog very, very well. Um, but as I said a minute ago, I had disparaged reward-based training for 18 years of my professional career. Then about a dozen years ago, a client who knows that I'm pretty comfortable thinking outside the box suggested I look at this uh, reward-based uh, marker training DVD. And I kind of rolled my eyes <laughs> and like, oh, yeah, I'm not a treat trainer. You know, give me give me a break. I'm not going to bribe my dogs. And I threw up on the desk. And it was probably two weeks later that I, I uh, plugged it in. And I think it was probably almost three hours long. And 10 minutes into that thing, I was just shaking my head going, Alec, you are an utter idiot. This is phenomenal. Uh, we just make assumptions about things we don't know. And I had assumed and used confirmation bias of the dogs that had come in that people had done some sort of quote unquote treat training with. They were terrible. They didn't do what they were supposed to do. They're always biting my hands looking for food and <laughs> so I used confirmation bias and said see you know I think it's stupid and there's proof it's stupid um, and when I looked at the DVD I saw what real uh, reward based marker training is uh, reward based meaning maybe initially food but down the road it could be a reward of a, a retrieve or something else the dog likes mm -hmm. uh, Marker training is nothing more than operant conditioning. Marker is an audible. The dog hears when it does the command correctly, and that's followed by the delivery of the reward. Okay, so you have two ways to train a dog. Classical conditioning, you know, Pavlov, ring a bell, um, feed the dogs pretty soon, ringing the bell, the dogs are salivating. And then you have operant conditioning, which is more of a um, uh, handler-induced um, uh, handler induced shaping procedure where the dog learns a language. Uh, some people use clickers and I can see your audience rolling their eyes going, Oh, clicker training. That's what those pet people do. But hear me out. Um, the dog hears an audible, a clicker. I tend to use the word yes to mark my dog. So let's say I have a young dog and um, it's a flushing dog and I would like it to hop and the first thing I'm going to do is something called free shaping, 
where I'm not even going to ask for a command, okay? Uh, I'm just in the house with a puppy, maybe 10 weeks old, something like that. And the, the puppy sits of his own accord. I'm just going to say yes, and I'm going to reach down and deliver a food reward. Every time that puppy does something I want, I'm going to mark the behavior with the yes, and then deliver a food reward. And maybe I'll walk along and hold my hand down uh, by my left calf, and the puppy falls along in the follows along in the heel position, and I'll say yes, and I'll allow it to uh, access a food reward. But I'm not giving it a command. I'm just kind of shaping that behavior. So, that, so, so the so eventually, though, you have to come up with a word, and where show us where the the nexus is between the shaping and the uh, introduction of a command word okay uh, a great way to think about it don't name it until you love it okay uh, everyone's used to putting their little dogs on leashes and pulling the leash and going sure. heel 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 and it's just kind of blah 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 to the dog uh, you know obviously it, it works but it's just a little bit of blah 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 I'll do a, a bunch of free shaping, and I'll even do this with adult dogs. I have uh, dogs in the kennel right now that have some sort of obedience foundation from the, for from their owners, and they're a year old, but I'm still going to do some of that free shaping. I just go out in the exercise yard, and they start following me around, and I come to a stop, and they sit of their own accord, and I mark the behavior and reward them and walk and lure them in the heel position and once it's really sharp then as i strike off i will say heel yeah and the dog's yeah. walking to my side i will come to a stop and i will say sit so i overlay the commands once the dog knows how to do those behaviors and you transition from um free shaping uh to what you would call luring which i alluded to where uh hand movement with food in it gets the dog into the desired position you're mm -hmm. looking for. Mm -hmm. And then that segues into rather than actively luring with food in your hand in front of the dog's nose, you have uh, the dog in position and then you reward behavior by moving your hand over, rewarding the dog and moving your hand away. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's, it's, it creates a different dog, okay? Uh, in the old school training, we are active. We say sit, we say heal, we say come, and the dog is reactive. It comes, it heals, it sits, okay? Um, when you do uh, reward-based marker training, the dog is actually active and we're reactive. Uh, the dog's trying to figure out what it needs to do to get that darn treat dispenser to work. And they will offer behaviors, okay, um, trying to find out which one works to uh, get the reward. And it just creates sort of a, a different dog that, you know, really, if you think about it, in the old school way of training the foundation, the dogs learn to do something to avoid something unpleasant. It's really as, sim really as simple as that. I'm going to heal because if I don't, I get tugged on by the leash i'm going to sit because if i don't i get a tug on the leash i'm going to do this because if i don't it, it's going to be uncomfortable yeah where with the reward based foundation the dogs are like what could i do because i want to cooperate because it has a good result for me what you're saying alex sparks is uh the dog to a great degree depending on how you want to define it is training itself um which you know, some of the more far-sighted trainers have said exactly that to me over the years, but they are also training the trainer to a small degree. Now, I'm not saying they're manipulating you. Hopefully, you're smarter than all the dogs you train, but but it's more of a two-way street than than what you're calling compulsion. Am I right, right. on that? Am I missing something, or is that the? No, that, that that's exactly it. In the old days, you know. I said heal, I said sit, I said come, I pulled on the leash, you did it because I said so. And that's how we taught behavior, okay? Uh, with teaching behavior is different than enforcing behavior. Yeah, and right now, yeah. talking about teaching behavior, it's just a way um, that the, the dogs, the dogs love it, they're very sharp, they're very accurate, 
uh, very stylish. It's not unusual to put a dog even on something mild like a choke chain or a, um, a prong collar or something like that. And sure, they heal, but uh, it's kind of a little bit like they're on a death march. You know, their ears are back, their tails are down. And we've been told for a million years, well, that's just the way it is. It'll be okay in the long run. And generally, it is okay in the long run. But just because it's successful in the long run doesn't mean the process is validated. Um, so with this, the, it just creates a much happier, frequently faster response in the dog because they know the faster I get my, my butt on the ground on the sit command, um, the quicker I'm going to get this, this food reward. And, and there's actually some, um, I'm not an academic at all. Um, and I've only really learned about the science, sort of the science end of dog training over the past 10 years. Um, but there's, I mean, there's science behind this. People can say, oh, no, that's psychobabble and it's a bunch of BS and stuff like that. But, you know, there's real behavioral science behind all this and why it works so well. Well, I'm intrigued, and, and it is, uh, you know, there are a lot of people who incorporate bits and pieces of all of this, and, and some of us do it unknowingly. Uh, but I, And I know I do want to talk more about young dogs, but just take me through a scenario with a dog that we're trying to get ready for the field. It doesn't matter which dog it is. Let's just, you know, let's just use a Springer Spaniel at the moment. Uh, but a flushing breed that you want to, uh, Hup's a perfect example. Uh, yep. and, we, and we can apply this to any dog at any point in their career. But shape that dog uh, walk us quickly uh, you know condense uh, you know all the training to get to a good steady hub into a minute and yeah. a half <laughs> I, I really have all that time yeah so um, so, so first, yeah if first, you don't need it go ahead and keep it shorter <laughs> uh, with a dog of any age that's it's uh, uh still a novice in its training we, we aren't talking about preparing a, a finished dog for the season so your six month one year old year and a half old flushing dog comes into my kennel i'm gonna first do some free shaping with the dog on heel on hop uh i'm gonna mark and reward it when it just comes to me i'm gonna create this little language with the dog that it knows when i say yes it's done something correct the faster it does it the faster Faster, it's going to get this reward. That's going to be the foundation. And then I'm going to overlay traditional traditional tools on top of that, leashes and collars on top of that. So the dog knows to walk at my side because it's a great place. Because if I walk here, man, I sometimes that treat machine offers me something. And when he comes to a stop or says hop, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to uh, um, put my butt on the ground. So now with the leash and collar on the dog, I walk along and as I ask it to uh, hop or sit, I give it a little leash pressure. It, it assumes the proper position. I'm still going to mark it and reward it. So I'm overlaying the traditional leash and collar on top of the marker system. Okay. Yeah. And then in, in my program, I'm then going to overlay the electric collar on top of the leash and collar while I'm still marking the dog and rewarding it. Now it's gone to a irregular reward schedule where initially the dog's probably being rewarded 100% of the time for command compliance. Now we're going to segue into a uh, irregular reward schedule, which is a great driver of behavior. People go, well, it's just not getting a reward all the time. It's not going to work. Think about slot machines. Think about lottery uh, tickets. It's the anticipation of a big payout is a great driver of behavior. You don't have to get rewarded all the time. So I'm going to fade the reward with some dogs that may transition to me throwing a retrieving dummy. Sure. The dog sits. The dog sits, I go, yes, I throw a retrieving dummy rather than giving it a food reward. And that's irregular. The leash and collar overlaid, the electric collar overlaid with the leash and collar simultaneously. Um, so the dog understands uh, command enforcement contextually. Uh, contextually is the dog understands when I ask it to, to hop, to come, or to heal, and it doesn't, and it feels the sensation from the remote collar, it needs to comply with those commands just like it would if I had tugged on the leash. Non-contextual use of a collar would be 
I put a collar on my dog and it runs out in the field and I call its name and give it a give it a shock with the collar. Well, the dog has no frame of reference to understand what that sensation means. It's no context to it whatsoever. And you're kind of leaving it up to the dog to try and figure out that, oh, something bad happened out here. Maybe I should go back to my owner. Yeah, and I've literally yeah. seen dogs run the other way. So uh, unless you're de-snaking, de-roading, de-deering dog, um, I don't believe, I'm not a big fan of non-contextual collar use. And my collars are all used in a contextual fashion. Well, that's a good chance to break for just a moment. We've got a lot more to discuss with Alex Sparks of Snowbound Kennels. And we've got a lot more to come on the Upland Nation podcast. This land is your land. I'll talk about some of the strategies we might employ in some less common public access areas and a few other things, including some of your great dog names coming up in just a moment. So, Alec, you take a quick break and I'll make the bills get paid around here. The Upland Nation podcast is brought to you in part by my good friend, Dr. Tim Hunt. He's a veterinarian. His dog food is a performance dog food, various formulations. If you want to take a look at the entire offering, go to D-R-T-I-M-S dot com. You know, Tim and I have been working on a couple videos, and one of the things that he really is adamant about, and I understand why now, if you're looking for the best proteins for your performance dog, they're animal and marine sources, fish, red meat, poultry, etc., etc. The main reason is the mix of amino acids and the quality of the protein and how much you need to deliver to a dog's belly. Now, you can get protein out of some plants, and a lot of dog food makers will use plant proteins. You know what I mean. Just look at the bag and the ingredient list. It takes four times as much plant protein to get the same nutritive value as it does from fish and animals. Take a look at the entire guaranteed analysis on any Dr. Tim's dog food, and then Go to drtims.com, use the code Upland Nation, and get 30% off your first order. Just tell them I sent you. You know, I love asking questions on Facebook, and lucky for me, you love answering them. I was going through some profile photos of a bunch of AKC breeds we used in a promotion a few years back. And I thought, I wonder, I wonder if that's something we should take a look at. So I asked you all on the Wing Shooting USA Facebook page, your favorite dog names. Now, I didn't ask uh, whether your dog is named that or not, but I thought I'd get some interesting answers, and sure enough, I did. I'm just going to touch on a few here. Charlene Coons Kramer says her favorite dog name is Jazz, her first Labrador. And great picture. Looks like a field trial blind, and both of them in there probably waiting for somebody like me to try and shoot down a pigeon or something. John Cramblett likes Bridget Beanie Buckwheat, and then he's got a C in there too, Chloe. Steve Haverly's dog is Lucky, and his dog's name was Dandy, which be his second choice, so maybe he's working on that right now. A great picture of Eva <laughs> pointing, beautiful short hair in the field. Philip Urban, thanks for sending that photo. It's one photo, it's wonderful. Speaking of photo, let's see, there was, oh yeah, there it is. My best old buddy Nitro is what Mike shares with us. It's an old Labrador, and he's he's looking a little old there, maybe hunting a little hard. Jeff Nelson says, I pick the dogs and she picks the names. Had two Britneys named Mitzi, one after the other. That's easy on everybody. Now a GSP named Elsa. The next one, already working on Anna. Good job. Joseph Sakura, I want to know why you named your uh, your wire hair Haraka. That must be a foreign language something for me, so uh, good for you. And then finally, Mr. Bodine, Bo for short. A little happy 
Labrador puppy sitting on the hearth. Chris Dean, thanks for sharing that one with me. So many more. I'll have to do this again sometime. Uh, some great photos to go along and uh, appreciate all of your contributions there. That might have been the most popular post all day yesterday. All right. Well, we are back in business here. Um, Alec Sparks, are you still there? I certainly am. Okay. What's your favorite dog name? <laughs> and don't uh, say damn it oh because that's gosh. mine. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I liked uh, Go Go. Her paper name was Go Dog Go. Yeah. And she was followed up by another pointer whose name was Zoom Zoom. <laughs> oh, my. Yeah. You know, it's kind of hard to yell that one in the field. It, without sounding silly, though. <laughs> yeah, I just he just came to Zoom. You know, the funny thing about Gogo is you aren't supposed to name your dog any name that could be confusing with commands. Well, yeah, her name was yeah. Gogo. Her name was Gogo. I called her Go. She stopped on Woe. She turned on Ho, and she certainly knew the word no, and she didn't have any trouble with any of those commands. Well, interestingly, I, I in in one of my books, I mentioned exactly that. Change all of those so that there's nothing that sounds the same. Thank God it wasn't named Bo on top of everything else. But but I, then at one Pheasant Fest, I had a guy come up to me and he said, he said, I read that and I, I've got it. I got to argue that with you. And we spent a couple beers arguing over that. And he convinced me that, you, like you said, Alec, dogs are smarter than we think they are. And that's one way to know it. I, I've always argued that dogs hear vowels. They don't hear consonants. But uh, I'll, I, I think I think in, I think in the word inflection is the key. I can scold a dog using words of praise or praise yeah, a dog, yeah. cuss it out, and it's really the inflection uh, that makes the biggest impact. So, um, speaking of that kind of thing, let's let's go back and, and just look at a couple bits and pieces of uh, of a, a puppy's first few months in in the home, in the kennel, in their career, if you will. And talk about some of the things that we should always do with that puppy if we want that dog to become a great hunting dog. Well, um, get it out of the darn kennel. You know, I think it's pretty much long been proven that uh, just keeping dogs, as I refer to them, kennel vegetables, there's no benefit to that. Uh, I know everyone isn't in a situation where they can have uh, dogs in the house or multiple dogs in the house. And quite frankly, sometimes our dogs are out in the kennel uh, or in my dog trailer or in a crate. Uh, I want my dogs comfortable everywhere. So the, the, the two things that I think are really important is one is everyone tosses around the word socialization. Okay. Um, and I think there's a lot of misconceptions what socialization is. So I see people socializing their dogs and their dogs are dragging them around from person to person and dog to dog. And there's no rules. And I go, I'm socializing my puppy. Um, to me, 65, 70% of socialization is social neutrality, knowing that you don't get to see every person, you don't get to see every other dog, you really want to be focused on me, I'm the most important thing in your life, but of course they need to go places, uh, funny staircases, um, unusual surfaces. Uh, when it comes to the field work with puppies, I think it's super important to not try to keep the puppy to any schedule, whether it's a previous dog that you had or your buddy's dog or worst case scenario, what it, what someone online told you or what it said in a book. Uh, I had a gentleman a number of years ago that was just bound and determined to follow this process that was in a book written by the person who owned the kennel. But the problem was he didn't have the right dog for it. He had a very, very kind of immature, shy female. And the process in the book called for a really bold, aggressive young dog. And he was trying to do all this advanced stuff with the puppy, uh, according to the book. And the, the puppy was clearly just miserable. It hated the whole thing. But his, in his enthusiasm, you know, he got caught up following a schedule that the dog doesn't know exists. So um, don't try and follow a schedule other than training the dog at your side. 
and try to always introduce it to everything in a very positive fashion. Very common up here in the Northeast, people, someone maybe got a puppy over the winter and they're dying to get it out early in the spring. Well, springtime in the Northeast, uh, the puddles are basically just melted snow. Um, the puppies run through that in their enthusiasm. They have very thin coats. Uh, they don't have uh, much muscle mass uh, uh, to help with thermal regulation and they get absolutely freezing and then they're like oh i don't want to go out in that field anymore um same thing with people going oh it's a cover dog i got to get it in the cover i got to get it in the cover and pretty soon that little puppy's just walking behind them because it's sick of getting its nose scratched uh by briars and twigs and grass and things like that so always important to uh you can't do what you want to do. You have to do what's best for the puppy and put it out in conditions that will create that, that bold forward dog that you want um, because it hasn't encountered something where it's had a bad experience. Man, that is so true. And so many people do not do it quite that way. You're listening to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden. That's Alex Sparks with Snowbound Kennels. You can find Alec in uh, the Upland Almanac magazine every once in a while. And, hey, you can find me. I think I have a story in this copy here. Let me see. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder where the check is now. But um, how about the... Um, uh, how about the opposite? What should we always prevent a puppy from doing or that we should prevent ourselves from doing um, when we're shaping that pup's behavior? Um, I always, I always try and give the puppies the benefit of the doubt. You know, people, people uh, read my information in Upland Albanac. You know, I'm in there um, every single issue quarterly and the check cord and uh, they look at my information and go, oh, man, that guy's a control freak. OK, I'm just going to run my dog out in the woods and he's going to figure this all out himself. And th this guy must be a total control freak. Yeah, actually, just the opposite. <laughs> um, the the step by step process I follow in training is a process that I found that gives virtually every dog the best chance of success. But you only control the dog as much as that particular dog would need to be controlled. I run my dogs on a very, very loose leash. I'm not an A-type personality. I don't think I have to be the alpha. I don't try and dominate my dogs. I don't over control them. But if I ask them to turn or come or hop, I expect them to do that. But just because they know how to do that doesn't mean I'm doing it constantly. I mean, when I drive my truck, I, I move the steering wheel when I get to a turn. I don't go down the straightaway just weaving back and forth because I have that ability. All right. So um, I think it's important to uh, to uh, give let your let your young dogs be young dogs. Let them be puppies. OK, let them experience the world in a very, very positive way. Our life revolves around clocks and schedules and appointments and all sorts of pressure. And we tend to put our dogs on those schedules, like I alluded to before. Um, I've never seen a dog with a calendar or a watch, okay? People say, how long is it going to take me to train, um, train my dog? And I can give them some pretty good estimates based on my years of experience. But it's like a, if I ask you, how long is it going to teach you, uh, is it going to take you to teach me to play tennis? Well, I don't know. How, how athletic are you? How coordinated are you? How committed to this are you? Um, and it's, it's the same with dogs. You just have to really train the dog at your side. Uh, everyone just needs to take a deep, deep, deep breath and not try to keep up with the Joneses and try to not let uh, their, their uh, personal baggage, whether you want to call it ego or whatever, get in the way that my dog's slow. People think I'm a bad trainer. <laughs> I, have an outstanding, I have an outstanding dog. People think I'm wonderful. OK, yeah, um, yeah. just the, the dog sets the program and we really need to kind of embrace them for what we have even if it's not exactly what we wanted. Oh man, I've, I've seen that a hundred times at, at a training day or at a um, hunt test or a NAVDA test or anything else. There are people who have performance anxiety for any number of reasons. The first one being, well, that guy's dog is doing that and he's the same age. It's incredible. You know, 
Uh, you you touched on this, but I just want to get clear on this. Uh, we do have ways to, um, I'll use the term, correct a dog. You mentioned the, uh, you know, a prong collar, a choke chain, or a leash, or, but you also use a verbal version of that early on, so that you can, again, overlay these things in various ways. Um, I use a I use the the classic German you know version of a ah something like that because that's what mom uses, but you use a word that we all know and that makes all the sense in the world, don't you? Yeah, I, I use wrong. So when I'm doing that introduction in uh, reward based marker training, and it's not unusual, the dogs go, "Hey, I, I think he's got I think he's got food in his hand. I don't have to do anything. I'm just going to get the food." And so if they tried to access my the food, I would just say wrong and i would move my hands behind my back or in a position where the dog can't access it and it it's it just builds that language that down the road um they understand wrong as i have done something incorrect like they understand yes or a click from a clicker as i have done something right you, you just build that language and, and of course the ultimately they're not getting the reward when you say that word so they're hopefully putting two and two together and making four instead of five like i do um, yeah. You know, the other thing, and I, and I think you touched on it again, but it just, it just, it is so logical that we skip these sort of things. And granted, dogs are so food oriented, so reward oriented anyway, it may not matter most of the time, but you, you suggest that uh, a hungry dog is a motivated dog. Well, you know, overfeeding is a little bit of a problem in America. Um, and uh, you, different dogs have different food motivations. If you have an extremely externally motivated dog, and I'm going to say externally motivated, it wants to know what's out there. It wants to go out there. It's not concerned about you or your darn food. I want to go out there and look for birds or something like that. Um, you know, dogs like that are going to be more difficult um, to perhaps do some of that uh, reward-based foundation with. Uh, so I'm not going to take my, my young dog out after its evening meal, even though it suits, you know, I get home from work, the dogs are fed, I have dinner, it's a lovely evening, I'm going to go work my dog. Well, the dog's been playing all day at home with the kids or in the backyard, and now it's had dinner. and <laughs> It's not very motivated to do anything. Mm -hmm. So I'm not suggesting uh, depriving dogs of food. I would say, well, try to do your marker training before feeding when the dog's most highly motivated for food. And uh, the thing about that whole reward-based system and why so many people have so many problems with reward programs is it's really, really complicated, okay? Anybody virtually can put a dog on a leash and collar and yank it around. I mean, really, anybody can do that. In a reward-based system, it's very difficult you have to take in consideration the value of the reward, how much does the dog like it, okay? You have to take in the, consider the volume of the reward, how much is the dog getting, okay? Um, the actual consistency of the reward, uh, I, I don't use anything soft or uh, crumbly, I should say, that the dogs could like a little biscuit where it would break into pieces and then the dog would go to ground trying to access the pieces that had fallen out of his mouth. Um, there's a reward schedule. There's accurately marking the behavior. There's the slight delay before the delivery of the food. Uh, there's a reward schedule. There's uh, transitioning and overlaying tools on top of that and fading to an irregular reward system. It's actually really, really complicated, and that's why so many people don't do well with food training is because they just don't do it well. Well, you know, so save us all a lot of trouble, uh, and I've got my own feelings on this, but I, I, I tend to agree with you wholeheartedly that um, the, the right food treat is, is uh, great, and the wrong food treat is probably worse than no food treat. What do you use on, on your dogs as a food treat? Um, because I go through so much, um, there's a product called Purina Moist and Meaty Steak Flavor. Um, 
Uh, I can get it in the supermarket around here, but I can also get it online. And it comes in a little cellophane packet uh, the size of my wife's fist, something like that. And I think it's meant to be a meal for a small dog. Sure. You know, we all yeah. for game burgers. You know, you rip open this little packet. So um, online, I can get 36 packets for $14. Uh, or I can go to the pet store and get basically two packets of a dog treat for $13. It's just incredibly affordable. Um, and most dogs like it. But I'll use whatever I have to. I mean, I've had dogs that weren't food motivated, and I bought a cheap cut of steak and cooked that up and threw it on the grill and cut it up. Very small pieces, roughly the size of a large garden pea. Um, how you hold the food is actually important. Um, but uh, the vast majority of my dogs uh, uh, seem to like that Purina moist and meaty steak flavor, and it's very affordable. Oh, I love that idea. I've got another use for that as well. I don't know about you, but when I hunt, my dog refuses to eat. So I'm bribing him with all sorts of things underneath his kibble at the end of the day. Um, do you use anything in particular for that? Yeah, actually I do. Uh, there's a dog food company called National, National Dog Food. Um, they're, they're pretty small. Not a lot of people know them. It's a fish-based food. It's really big. Uh, used to be anyway, uh, uh, very big with uh, the dog sled mushers. They make a product called um, uh, Energy Pack, and it's just a powder supplement. And I live in dairy country here in Vermont, so I know what calf milk replacer smells like. And this powder smells just like calf milk replacer. It's 40% fat, incredibly high fat content, and you can top dress your food. It enhances the flavor, and the dogs really like it. You're, you're getting calories with no more bulk, and you can actually bait their water with it. You yeah. can mix it yeah. with their water, yeah. so they're getting calories drinking water. But you need to be careful with that 40% fat. If you get too much in them, you're going to lose your stool integrity. Which would be a great name for a heavy metal band, by the way. <laughs> Stool integrity, <laughs> lack of stool integrity. <laughs> that, that's Alex Sparks with Snowbound Kennels. I'm Scott Linden. This is the Upland Nation podcast. Getting towards the end here, so I, I need to get down to it. Alec, uh, you got to tell me, um, what is the biggest mistake we make with e-collars? With electric collars? Yes. Uh, clearly, well, <laughs> there's a couple mistakes. Um, using them at too high a level. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you look at the instructions that come with all the collars and say, they say, start at the lowest level that you can see the dog feels. Well, for a lot of dogs, that's way too high. You're getting an eye blink, a head jerk, um, a tail drop, ears back, uh, lip licking, holding breath. Uh, shortening their range, not wanting to pull on the leash. They decide that they're just going to slink and start lagging behind, or you have a pointer on a check cord that's been pulling with 50 pounds, 40 pounds of pressure against the check cord, and now all of a sudden it's only pulling with 20 pounds. Yeah. Um, even though people always say should in dog training. Okay, the dog should be able to take that. I felt it. It's not high. The dog should be able to. That, like that's irrelevant. There is no should in that part of dog training. Um, I advise people to start at a level that the dog may not even feel. And if it does feel it, it's just a sensation. We aren't trying to correct the dog. We aren't trying to teach the dog with the collar introduction. We're trying to introduce the collar contextually so the dog understands that feeling is what is enforcing the command rather than the leash or the check cord. So uh, mm -hmm. start at low levels, gradually, gradually increase those levels, watching your dog. And um, there's a very common thread that if something's not working, I just need more pressure. Okay, I need to <laughs> turn my collar up. I need to pull harder. I need to push harder. That's always the answer. Occasionally it is the answer, but it's not the answer as frequently as people want to uh, apply it. People tend to, I call them backyard wonders. They do great in the training field. They do great in the backyard. 
And then they expect that same level of performance out in the field. And when they don't get it, they go to higher intensities and more pressure to try and get it. You really, in order to be fair to the dog, you really need to uh, use something called successive approximation where we're going to gradually expose the dog to different situations, which is called generalizing. But we're going to gradually ask for more and more, longer and longer, faster and faster, different places around different distractions. And you just do all that very gradually. And, you know, a lot of people just don't have the temperament for it. When someone t contacts me about help with training their dog as opposed to me training their dog, I ask them a simple question. I say, do you want to train dog or do you want to learn how to train dogs? Yeah. And overwhelmingly, most hunters want to train dogs. They don't really want to learn how to train dogs. And it's kind of unfair to the dog when you're using uh, tools of consequence, uh, whether they're prong collars, choke chains, um, uh, or electric collars, who's on the sharp end of that stick? Okay. Certainly not you. Um, certainly the dog is, and it's, it's just way too common that when things go wrong, we blame the dog. I mean, when was the last time you saw someone miss a clay target and they said, Oh, I put the, the gun in the wrong place. It's, uh, <laughs> it's the wrong shot size, the wrong choke, the wrong choke manufacturer, the wrong feet per second, um, the wrong barrel length. I need another millimeter on the comb. People just kind of have a hard time, myself included, owning up to their, their, their own, uh, a part in why things haven't come out successfully and there can be really difficult dogs to train but when you have a difficult dog you have to be a better trainer you don't just turn up the pressure um, you have to be a smarter trainer figure out what I need to do um, dogs are incredibly forgiving um, uh, given given their canine teeth it's kind of nice they're forgiving um, I'm kind of surprised that dogs are as forgiving a lot of breeds are as forgiving as they are um, because they go through a, a lot at the hands of, uh, you know, unskilled people using tools of compulsion and the dog is the one that kind of suffers. So I'm a bit, I'm a really big, uh, try to be a big spokesman for the dogs and train them in a fair, humane and compassionate uh, uh, way. Well, I can't argue any of that. I'm a big believer. Sometimes my ego gets in the way, but I'm doing my best. I promise you I will have more to share with you. And you, Alex Sparks of Snowbound Kennels, thanks so much for being a part of the Upland Nation podcast. Let's do this again and carry on from right here where we left off. I'd love to uh, in the future, and thank you very much. Uh, like I said, it was an honor being on your podcast, and I hope your listeners found uh, what I said interesting. And I encourage anybody, uh, if they wanted to know more specifically uh, about a problem or an issue with their dog, or they think I'm totally crazy and want to tell me that to their my face, uh, feel free to contact me. I don't have a website. But I do have a uh, Facebook page, Snowbound Kennels, and all my contact information is there, and I'm always available to talk to people. There you have it, Snowbound Kennels on Facebook. Alex Sparks, also with Upland Almanac Magazine, so you can catch him there in uh, great detail and uh, probably get your own thought process kind of turned around a little bit. Alec, thanks again for being on the podcast. Thanks for having me. And don't you go away. We got lots more, including a kind of a strategy for looking for public ground in our This Land is Your Land feature coming up right after this. HappyJackInc.com, HappyJackInc.com. Working hard with them. Uh, thank you, Joe and Manning Exum, for your sponsorship and for all the great products that I use from you. Flex Enhance Plus is the one I'm working with most often these days. If your dog is slowing down in the field, if he's just not doing it, or if he has a hard time coming out of his crate in the morning, or he won't jump up or down off the tailgate or the training table, well, I hate to break it to you, but he probably has some arthritis and it will probably get worse. Now, we all know this happens to older dogs, most dogs over eight years old. But the scary part is some dogs will get arthritis as young as one year old. 
I'm not taking any chances. I'm giving Flex Enhance Plus to Flick right now. He's almost four and we're playing it safe because the things that work out of Flex Enhance Plus are the things that our joints need. Glucosamine is number one on the list. It's right there and it's the thing that's going to keep those joints functioning Firing on all eight cylinders. If you want to learn more about what's in Flex Enhance Plus besides that, and you want to watch the video we just did, go to happyjackinc.com. Learn all about how arthritis works. Also, learn some of the other things you might want to be doing to prevent the onslaught of arthritis in your hunting dog. And This Land is Your Land is brought to you by FindBirdHuntingSpots.com. Thank you for visiting. Lots of you coming by and learning something, I hope. New videos up there once in a while, a new article every week or so. I help you finding places to hunt. A few training tips, suggestions, and advice. Taking care of your dog and yourself. I told you I was fishing over the weekend and I was sitting there watching an otter. Actually, of all things, uh, I was holding still in the middle of that river, and that's the best time to watch wildlife. But realized that, you know, I'd forgotten that over there, that tributary to that river, could be good rough grouse country. And I looked back on some of my other great fishing spots. A certain desert trout stream, well, heck, more than one. One, two, three, four, right off the top of my head that also harbor chuckers and valley quail. There's a steelhead spawning stream that has mountain quail on it. And how many times have I or you shot ringnecks in the cattails around a pond? Yeah, think about all those fishing spots in a different light. We spell scouting F-I-S-H-I-N-G. More tips at findbirdhuntingspots.com. And I hope you picked up a tip or two this week. Thank you, Alex Sparks of Snowbound Kennels, for all your advice. Find him on the Facebook page, Snowbound Kennels. Thank you all for listening. If you liked what you heard, tell your friends. Please subscribe, rate, or review us on Apple Podcasts in particular. It really does help, and I appreciate that in advance. Thank you, Gil M2, for your kind review in recent days. Appreciate that. I'll leave you with food for thought. Speaking of treats, this is from author Phil Pastorette. Phil says, if you think bird dogs can't count, try putting three biscuits in your pocket and then giving your dog just two of them. Enjoy the rest of your week. Hug your dog. Be nice to your family. I'm Scott Linden. Thanks for listening. See you in the field. <laughs>